Welcome to South Point Church Online, wherever you might be watching from today. And if this is your first time, we're so glad that you chose to be with us. Hey, my name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point. Today, I wanna dive right into the deep end and let you know why sticking around may really matter for every single person watching today, regardless of where you're at with faith. And it actually comes from a quote from someone who is in the profession of science. And I'm gonna share that quote with you this morning, and it's this, everyone. So it doesn't matter whether you showed up and you're exploring faith or you don't have faith, or maybe you grew up in a different faith, or maybe you've been going to church, it says everyone has it, but no one wants to talk about it. See, we all have this it, right? But none of us wants to talk about it. And I can tell you, and science has told us, that when you and I talk about this it that everyone has, all of us will have a visceral response. And visceral means like, we will react very strongly. Some will react this way. Well, that's not me, I'm just gonna ignore it. Uh, that's not my life and we, we just ignore it because we don't wanna feel that thing that's just unbearable. And for others, the response will be equally as strong and you'll want to run from that. And so right from the start, this thing that everyone has, right, that all of us have that we don't wanna talk about, I'm gonna encourage you, please don't ignore it. Please don't run from it. Would you stick around until the very end? And here's why this matters so much to us today. I'm gonna to put it up on the screen, it's this. It's the number one enemy. The thing that we're gonna talk about, this it that everyone has, it is the number one enemy to my mental health and to your mental health and to our mental health and of our quality of life. This thing impacts every area of life. Now, I wanna tell you a story how I came face to face with the it that causes us to want to ignore it or to run from it. And matter of fact, this face-to-face -face encounter with the number one enemy of both our mental health and the quality of our life happened when I was about 14 or 15 years old. I was still in the juvenile justice system, and I'll never forget the day. I, I remember kind of what the weather was. I, I kind of remember where I was. Uh, my biological dad had called me, which immediately set off alarms in my mind and in my heart and my soul because my biological dad really didn't ever call me when I was um, incarcerated to like just talk. And so I get on the phone and go, hello, and there's a little bit of brief chitter chatter. And then my biological dad said these words that I'll never forget. He said, um, the Christian counselor that we sent you to um, has recently been arrested and convicted uh, for molesting children. And I wanted to see if that happened to you. And in that moment, the number one enemy of my mental health and your mental health and the quality of our life was very present. And I paused for a second, and then I simply uttered the words, well, no. And there was a pause on the other end of the line, and I'll never forget my biological dad said, are you sure? And I said, yeah. And then he said, okay. And then the call ended. And I'll never forget as I was hanging up the phone, how I wish that my biological dad had uttered or said very different words. Like before he asked me the question, you know, no matter what you say, your stepmom and I will love you. No matter what happened, it wasn't your fault. You, you were 10 or 11 at the time. I wish he would have said something that would have drawn me out and said that you are my son and you matter and, and I love you. But as I hung up the phone, I walked away going, it must be true. I'm unlovable and I am damaged goods. I came face to face in that call on that day with the number one enemy of our mental health and the quality of our life. And it's a word that you've probably heard of before and it's called shame. This wasn't my first encounter with shame, unfortunately. As a little kid, probably six or seven, I remember being traumatized as I watched my friend's mother get beat by a drunken uh, roommate, a guy, because we had been playing too loud and she had to drive herself to the ER with her face full of blood and the shame that we felt that it, it was our fault. The encounter I had is my stepdad had physically abused me. Or when my mom walked in and I was discovering what it meant to be a boy. Or when my biological dad said, you're dead to me or when they told me that my mom had taken her own 
life. Shame. Shame is something that I'm familiar with. And here's what I want to say in this moment. That, that there are two kinds of people out there right now. Those of you that have experienced trauma like me, I want to stop and I want to say, do not turn this off. And if you do, please come back. Please, I understand that in the pain, the unbearableness of that feeling of shame, you will want to run and hide. Please don't because there is hope. And there are others of you that are watching this. And you'll say this, well, shame doesn't apply to me. I had good parents. I grew up in a good home and my life was very normal. And you, shame will lie to you and tell you just because you haven't experienced trauma that you don't have shame. I'd like to read a section of a book that I've recently read that I highly recommend. It's called The Soul of Shame by Dr. Kurt Thompson. And I love how he words this for those of you that maybe haven't experienced trauma. He says it this way, shame, as it turns out, lives in the smallest of details in the commonest moments, and that's exactly where shame wants to remain. Yes, it comes into the bedroom of a child, and I won't go any further, but more often, however, it lives in the less obvious glance or tone of a voice that lasts but a second and lingers for weeks. It thrives in the silence of questions of generosity, genuine curiosity never asked, or words of encouragement or thanks or praise that was never offered. It emerges in the emotional neglect that seems so minor until its accumulated absence leaves a neglected child with no option but to imagine a story, mostly a silent movie, in which he or she is not important to their father. This will seep into the story that he or she tells themselves about what it means for them to be a friend, a sibling, a husband, a father themselves. But it will also infect the sense of who they are to God. Shame loves to tell its version of a good tale. It sits in boardrooms of directors, fearing the shame that fuels their own vulnerability, refusing to make hard choices necessary to effectively care for their employees while continuing to permit people to have behavior that's irresponsible. It walks in the school hallways into classrooms where administrators fearing funding drive their teachers, who drive their students, who drive their parents crazy, who in their fear of not being enough complain that the administrators are not doing enough to get their children into the school that they want. It looks in the academy where the professor does not produce and she is not noticed, and if not noticed, tenure won't be realized, and the backbiting and gossiping and undermining to the noble commitment to the pursuit of knowledge withstanding. Shame is in the words of our sermon, our Facebook posts, about the sermons and our rhetoric about sexuality, immigration. Shame screams at the players on the court, the soldiers in basic training. It writes and speaks about the politician as well as her opponent, depending on the papers the editor's pen is in. It repeatedly tells the story of the world made up of we and they, and they are always the bad people. And the bad people always end up on the open end of a barrel of judgment. And judgment, it turns out, comes easily in the form of fiery words or hot lead both leaving bodies on the field. And those who follow Jesus often find that we have as much difficulty with this as anyone, I being the chief sinner. Everyone has it, shame, and yet none of us wanna talk about it. And so today, as we address this silent thing that all of us experience, that all of us have, I wanna identify what exactly shame is. And so I kind of created a definition I wanna share and it's this, shame is a covert assassin that tries to kill all the good in life that God intended. You see, shame comes to us as our friend. It's this little voice in your head that says, I'm your friend, I'm here to protect you. But shame is not your friend, shame is not your protector, shame is a covert assassin that will try to destroy all the good that God intended. You see, the very human experience is to be connected to creation, to God, and to each other. But shame tells us that we should cover ourselves. Shame tells us that we should hide, and shame tells us that we blame. It literally comes against everything that you were meant for, and I was meant for, and that the world was meant for. Shame is not our friend, it is not our protector, it is an assassin that just tries to destroy the goodness, all the goodness that God wants to bring in your life, and in my life, and our life. Now, I wanna be really clear, there is a difference between guilt and shame. And so guilt goes something like this. 
Guilt says, I did damage. Listen, there are times where I got mad and I yelled at people and I was wrong. I needed to admit I was wrong. I needed to say I was sorry. I needed to make restitution so that relationship could be restored. Listen, we'll all have guilt because we all get it wrong. Guilt says, I did damage. Shame is very different. Where guilt says, I did bad, shame says, I'm damaged and I'll always be damaged. I am inherently bad. There is something broken in me. And here's why shame is so devastating. Here's why we need to know. Here's why though we wanna run. Here's why today when we wanna ignore that we need to talk about our number one enemy to our mental health and to the quality of our life. And I'm gonna put it up on the screen and it's this. The story told in our minds who is telling the story in our mind? What voice is telling the story in our mind of who we are and what we're meant for and how we're supposed to live? The story told in our minds leads to the story that we tell with our life. And if shame is the voice telling the story, then what kind of story will our life tell? This is why it matters, because the story that we tell with our lives, that we live with our friends and our family and our vocations and in this world, all starts with the story that gets told in our mind. And it leaves you, and it leaves me asking a really hard question. This thing that everyone has, but no one wants to talk about, comes from a professional counselor and author and writer and speaker, Brene Brown. If everyone has it, but no one wants to talk about it, how do we actually address that today in a real and relevant and compassionate and engaging way? And there is some good news in the midst where we want to ignore it and we want to run from it because shame is an unbearable feeling, right? We just don't, we can feel sad, we can feel angry. The one thing we don't want to feel is shame and we will do anything not to feel shame. That's why the power of addiction is so strong in so many of us. And there is some good news in this tough topic and it's this, you are not alone. I'm not alone because everyone, whether you've had trauma or not, all of us hear the voice of shame in our hearts and our souls and our minds. We are not alone in this. And the fact that shame would try to tell us the story in our brain so it'll be the story that we live out in life breaks the heart of God. And it breaks God's heart so much that God did the unimaginable so that no one's story would have to be told by shame. Unfortunately, shame started at the very beginning of humanity, even though it wasn't supposed to start or begin that way. And in the beginning, we discover what shame looks like and what shame is all the way back in the beginning. So this morning, I want to take a look at where this voice that we'll never get rid of this side of eternity, like all of us are going to have to deal with it this side of eternity. It's a poison that's been passed down from the very beginning. And we're going to see where this comes in. But I want to start before that because that isn't the original story. The original story that you and I are meant to live for is very different. Matter of fact, we find this in Genesis 2, 25. I'm going to put it up on the screen. It says, now the man and his wife were both naked. I bet you can't believe I said naked on church. Naked. See there, I said it, right? <laughs> like, now the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no, what's that word? Maybe you want to type it in the chat. They felt no shame. Think about that. I mean, God could have used any word to record in history about how Adam and Eve felt that God gave them a whole planet, right? Filled with f food and beauty and seashores, right? And animals. And then his first command was, you know, to be fruitful and multiply. We know what that means, right? God gave all this amazing gift and they were naked and they felt no shame. Why didn't they write they felt no fear? Why didn't they say, you know, they felt no sorrow. They were so full of joy. Why does it say they, they felt no, like, sad? Why is it the, they use the word shame that God gives us? Because something is about to happen. You see, this picture is so beautiful. Because man and woman were both naked. They could be fully seen and fully known by each other. 
They could be fully seen and fully known by creation, and they could be fully seen and fully known by their creator, and they were at peace with that. They did not fear that they would be abandoned or injured or hurt. They were at true peace. They were totally vulnerable and totally available to know all about who they were. And there was no shame. And we know how the story goes, right? There's an enemy who slips into the garden and he does two things to Eve. By the way, Adam's right there watching. He should have been helpful, but he wasn't, right? And the enemy tells Eve this thing. Well, should you really trust God? And then he kind of plants the seed. Are you sure you're really enough? Because if you ate this fruit, you would be more than what you currently are. Like you'd be like God. So maybe you're not really all that you should be. Maybe you're really not enough and maybe you shouldn't trust God. Maybe you should reach out to be enough and not trust God. And I want to say that voice still cries out to you and I today. Don't trust God. You are not enough if you don't reach out and grab it yourself which has led to where the world is today. And we see what happens. We see what happens in response to the eating and disobeying God that they weren't supposed to do. And we pick it up in Genesis 3 and it says this, at that moment, their eyes were opened. They could see differently. And suddenly, did you notice that? Felt shame. I want to stop here. They felt no shame before, but before God showed up, before God gave any consequences to their disobedience, before anything, shame did its work all by itself. They felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to, what's that word? Cover themselves. Isn't that what we do in life? No one gets to see the real me. They're only going to get to see the me that I cover up and let them see. Well, it continues. They covered up. And what happens next is when the cool of the evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. God wanted to spend time with his friends because humankind was meant to be in relationship with God. That's what we are created for. That's our true story. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. So their first response was to cover themselves. But then when God shows up, the very person that they were made to be in relationship, to spend time with, they hid. They hid. I wonder how many of us today showed up and we've been hiding from God, the one that we were created to be in relationship, our true story. And then God asks a question. Matter of fact, God asks two questions. And these are so important, and we're going to get to them a little bit later. But we pick this up. It says, Then the Lord God to the call to the man, Where are you? He's their friend. He loves them. He's their creator. Where are you? And I wonder today if you would hear the voice of God calling out to you, Where are you? Adam responds like most of us. I was afraid because I was naked. I'm afraid to come to you, God, because I did this. I'm afraid to come to you, God, because I'm broken like this. I'm afraid to God to come to you because this was done to me. I think we still answer God's call, where are you, with the same thing. I'm afraid that you might see me as I truly am. And I love God's response. Who told you? Who's telling you a different story than the story that you were actually meant for? Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Where are you? And who told you are such important questions that I want you to hold on to that. But we need to see that the response of Adam and Eve, their response to their disobedience of experiencing shame wasn't just covering, it just wasn't hiding. Oh, it included a third thing that I'm really good at and I bet you're really good at and I know the world's really good at. And we catch it up and it says this, the man replied, now I want to stop here. Adam is talking to God, listen to his response. He says, it was the woman you gave me. Can you hear that? 
God gave Adam a whole planet. He gave him a woman. He said, the only thing you can't do is eat this one fruit. And when he does it, he tries to blame God. God, the woman you gave me, gave me the fruit and I ate it. Like she kind of held his arm and made him, right? And then so God asked Eve why she ate it. And she says, the serpent deceived me. Hey, you know that animal you put here? You know, God, the animal that you created? So they are both playing what? The game that we continue to play up to this very day, the blame game. And so we see before God even shows up, before God gives consequences, the result of shame leads to destruction and death. Shame will tell a story that you and I were never, ever meant for. What is the story that shames ask us to tell with our lives? I want to put it up on the screen. We keep doing this. They covered themselves. I don't want you to see me. I don't want God to see me. And I don't want the creation to see me. So they covered themselves. They hid from God, the very one that they were made to be in a relationship with. And then they blamed. And I would suggest that this story is getting lived out every day in every culture, on every continent, in every generation. And I would suggest that this response of shame is where all the brokenness of the world comes from because we cannot be ourselves around other people because they'll hurt us and they'll abuse us. We hide from God, our creator, and we do nothing but blame. And this is where shame lives at. And it tries to tell a story that doesn't lead to life. Shame is a poison. And it is so devastatingly harmful. And it's so harmful for two really important reasons. Listen, I, I know sometimes the kids are playing. I know sometimes your coffee's cold or sometimes there's something going, but I want everyone to lean in. Here is why shame. You just, here's the two reasons why you need to know shame is something that you and I should always uh, fight against and not listen to and not let tell a story. Number one, it is not your friend. Shame is the enemy. Shame is the enemy. It is not your friend. It is a weaponized lens that leads to isolation and self-destructive behaviors. Let me say, shame is a lens that is weaponized that creates isolation and self-destructive behaviors. Shame is not our friend. Shame is not our protector. And then here's the second thing. Shame keeps us from the life that you want, from the life that you were meant for, and for the life that Jesus conquered hell and death for. And here's what I mean. You know what it means to be human? To be human means to be that you are known and you know someone else. They see the real you. That we would live in community with each other and with our creation and with our creator. How can we live in relationship with each other? How can we live in relationship with our creation? And how can we live in relationship with our creator when we're always covering up, when we're always hiding, and we're always blaming. And the truth is, and you know it, and I know it, we already know this, this doesn't allow us to live. This doesn't allow us to experience the good that God intended for us to live. You see, shame lives in darkness. So what I wanna do today is I wanna pull back and let some light shed on shame so that none of us have to stay in a place of shame. Now, it is confession time. I want to say, I am no expert. Matter of fact, I've had to deal with shame all my life. I've been really horrible at dealing with it. I have mostly spent my life trying to stuff or avoid it or be busy, so I would never, ever have to face it. Like, I'm not an expert. Matter of fact, I'm going to share three secrets that we can unveil about shame that will reveal that there are just some simple things. I didn't say easy. They are simple. They're not easy, but they are simple things that anyone can do. So shame will not tell your story. So shame won't tell my story. They are simple, but not easy. And by the way, I'm just learning these. Like, I'm not an expert. Today, I just want to share as one struggling follower of Jesus to other people who may be struggling, if they're willing to at least take a look under this thing called shame, the number one enemy of the quality of our life and our mental illness. And so I wanna start off by sharing this truth briefly, and it's this, shame thrives in secrecy. I am not all that I wanna be. 
I mean, I don't know about you, but have you ever been like sitting somewhere just eating, you're not really talking to anyone, and you kind of play your day in your head and you think about, oh yeah, this morning I didn't do that thing that my wife wanted, or I yelled at that person at the work, or I cut that person off, or I could have done that report better. Oh, when I wrote that email, I probably didn't write it nice enough. You notice that when we like play the rewind reel in our brain as we go to sleep or when we're alone, it's never the highlights of all the amazing things we did. It's always the things we could have done Go ahead and type in the chat, better. Because you know, and I know, and we all know that when we're honest and we really look inside, we're not the person that we wish we were. And so Shane tells us, since I'm not the person I wish I would, how could anyone like or love the real me? If I don't love me, if I don't like me, how could anyone else like or love me? So what we do, is we cover up because covering up is safe. If I just pretend to be someone I think you'll like, then I'll do things differently than who I really am. And here's the problem with that. Here's why that doesn't allow us to live the life. This is, here's why it's the number one reason, enemy to mental health and the quality of life, and it's this right here we're gonna put up on the screen, and it's this, being truly seen and known is at the heart of what it means to be human. To be human means that you are connected to another person in genuine relationship where they see you and they know you, they know crazy you, and they are still your friend, right? That is the whole point of friendships and relationships. It's part of what it means to be human. That's why the worst form of punishment in humanity is isolation from other people. We call it solitary confinement because to be human means someone can see me and know me. But if we buy into the lie of shame, if we let shame say, I'm going to protect you and keep you safe because you don't even like you, make sure no one else sees you, then we'll never have a genuine relationship where someone knows us for who we truly are. I'll never forget experiencing this in somewhat of an awkward but impressive way that I'll actually never forget. I can remember exactly where I was. I was, gosh, I, I, was, I think I was before 12, so I was somewhere between 10 and 12. I was with my biological dad at the time and my stepmom, and I'll never forget, my, my biological dad was mad at me for something, and I'm, I'm sure I deserved it. Like, I was, I was a knucklehead, but I'll never forget the statement that he said to me. He said, what is wrong with you? Why are you so extremist? Either you don't do it or you do it all the way. Why are you hot or cold? What is wrong with you? Why just can't you be halfway about anything? And the message was loud and clear. Who you are isn't what I want and who you are is damaged and broken. So you better become something different. And the reality is, is that I can't do anything casually. I told my family I was gonna start playing this hobby and doing this hobby casually, and they all laughed and stopped and said, can you do anything casually? It's just who I am. I'm either all in or all out. There's usually no halfway for me. But for me to be truly me, you just need to know that. And I have to realize that that's just how God made me. And shame thrives in secrecy where we cover ourselves up and no one, not our spouse and not our friends, not our coworker, no one gets to see the genuine, real us, the parts of us that are broken and busted. And here's what I love about the question that God asked in the garden that is a part of your story, it's a part of my story, and it's a part of the story that every single human being who's ever existed is meant to be a part of. God asked, where are you? Matter of fact, I would say it this way. God sees all of you and he loves you so much that he came looking for you. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save. 
God saw us at our worst in all of our brokenness, with all of our flaws, all of our failures, all of our flaws and, and foibles, whatever you want to call them. And yet God saw all that and he still chooses to cry out, where are you? So today, no matter what has told you or who has told you that you are failed or you are flawed or you are broken or you are damaged, God is crying out today, where are you? Because he loves you. The true story is that there is a creator who sees you and loves you and is crying out, where are you? Humans are not meant to live covered and unseen. We're meant to have some relationships that are trustworthy and good and healthy, where someone can fully see us and still love us. That is the life that we are meant for. Which leads me to a brief observation new that we need to uncover about shame, and it's this. Shame thrives in the silent whispers. I can't tell you the number of times as I've gone to sleep, as I've woken up in the morning, as I've gone through my day, silence is sometimes very scary because often in the silence I'll hear the words, you'll never be enough. You can't give enough good sermons. You can't love enough people. You can't do enough good deeds. You'll never be enough. You're damaged goods. You're unlovable. And they will abandon you just like your mom and just like your dad. You see, shame will tell a story every day if you and I let it. And shame will replay the same record, the same tape, the same song, the same CD, the same Spotify playlist. He's got a playlist. Shame has a playlist for every single human being. And it's usually something like this. You just won't make it. You won't be enough. If they ever truly see you, you will be alone and you will be abandoned. You know, as I thought about this, I've bought into this for most of my life. And it leads me to ask as a follower of Jesus, someone who knows that God loves me, I can mentally understand that. I can mentally believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But yet, sometimes the voice of shame is so loud in my soul that I have trouble actually believing it. And here's why. If my own biological mom would abandon me, if my own biological dad would abandon me, if they both would treat me in such a way, and a way that makes me feel like you're not enough, you're unlovable, and you deserve to be alone. And you know, you would think as an adult, I would be wise enough to go, hey, you know, people that do wrong are probably hurt. But instead, here's the lie that I believed. And since my parents knew me the best, they had to be right. And since they're right, I better make sure no one knows me enough where they may discover the real me. Because if they do, I will be alone and abandoned, just like I was. But there's a problem with that. And I'm gonna put it up on the screen, it's this right here. Your story is not a single player game. Now, I'm not trying to play the blame game because there are no winners in the blame game. But as I look back at my story, as I look back at my story in moments where there was shame created in my heart and where I heard the voice of shame from people who were meant to love me and care for me and tell me a different story, I usually see the story as a single player. Oh, I was the kid that was too loud that caused the trauma of domestic violence. I was the kid too broken that had to be physically abused. Oh, I was the kid who was warped sexually, you know, that my mom walked in on. You know, I was the kid who was too bad that the father could love him and I should be disowned. I was the kid that no one wanted, so of course my mom didn't want to stay alive. But that is a single player story. And here's the reality. Shame always takes place in relationship. Did you catch that? Shame is always relational. 
And what is the truth about all those instances where shame screams so loudly that you are alone and you are abandoned? You'll never be enough. You're damaged goods. You're unlovable. The truth is, I wasn't a single player. There were other people in those stories. And see, here's the truth. Feelings are real, but they're not always right. I felt like it was my fault. I felt like I was unlovable. But what if those feelings, while real, weren't right? You know what I discovered? Shamed people, shame people. Hurt people, hurt people. Is it possible that the truth of my story, and maybe the truth of your story is, is that the shame that you've heard isn't a single player story, that there were other people who they were hurt and they were broken and they've passed a poison on to you. And what I love about the second question in the garden is that God doesn't blame and condemn. God asks a question. And I believe God's question echoes through eternity. And I believe that question is echoing to you and I today. Who told you? Who told you you'll never be enough? Who told you you were damaged goods? Who told you you were unlovable? Who told you you will be abandoned? Because that's not the story that God tells us. That's not the story that you and I are meant for. I love what God says I'm going to put up here. You are so loved that God broke heaven's bank. God didn't send junk. God sent his one and only son. Jesus died so we could become the sons and daughters. You were meant, I was meant to be a son or daughter of the creator. We, that's what we're destined and meant to be. We are deeply loved. That is the true story that shame tries to lie about. We do not have to hide from God. We don't have to listen to the false story and the lies that shame wants to tell us. Which leads me into the third thing where kind of shame thrives in. And shame thrives in judgment. Here's the lie. Never look inside, right? Like, whoo! Like, hey, if we're gonna talk about shame, like, I wanna talk about anything, I wanna do anything, other than talk about my shame. I was talking to my therapist the other day, and he said, hey, we really should take a look at some of those incidents of shame and walk through them. I go, oh no, I, I don't wanna do that. That's pain, like why would I wanna do that? That's painful. You and I know this, we never wanna look inside because that's scary, right? So what is wrong is always the, you might as well type it in, right? It's always the they on the outside, right? Like if we're never gonna look on the inside, then, What's wrong is always on the outside. And what happens if you and I listen to the voice of shame and we begin to play the blame game all the days of our life? You see, as insecure, hurt people who are listening to the voice of shame, we often unknowingly become conduits of shame to the very people that we love and we care about. We don't mean to, but we do. You see, here's the truth I'm gonna put up on the screen, it's this. Grace makes for healthy relationships. You see, there are no perfect people. This is some great, like listen, you should be fired up today. There are no perfect people. I'm not perfect, if you meet me, you're gonna go, oh, he's as crazy as he says he is. You just ask any of my friends or any of my coworkers, they'll just tell you, I'm just a a regular guy who's in desperate need of Jesus, right? So grace, the ability to give grace to one another, right, is necessary. It's what makes healthy relationships go. And we can't give what we don't have. And here's what I mean. If I've never received God's grace in my life, how in the world am I gonna give you grace for your life? Now I wanna stop here for a second. And I just wanna confess. I absolutely believe in the grace of God for other people. It's really hard to believe in the grace of God for my brokenness and for the horrific things that I did and for the horrific things that happened to me. It's so much easier to give grace to other people. But here's what I discovered. I can't give what I don't have. I may say I'm giving it, but the reality is that if I can't give myself grace, then how do I give you grace? And it ends up saying something like this. Well, shame tells me that I need to be better 
And so I'm gonna try to be better. I'm gonna try to suck it up. I'm gonna try to pull myself up by my bootstraps. I'm gonna work harder, try harder. I'm gonna be better. But if that's the voice that we're always listening to, then when other imperfect people who are just as imperfect as us, they're imperfect, we don't give them grace. We give them judgment. And man, if church isn't the one place that gives more judgment than anyone else. I've told people repeatedly for years that I love recovery. You know what I love about Narcotics Anonymous or Alcohol Anonymous or any or Celebrate Recovery is that when you go to recovery, no one pretends to be something they're not. There's no judging. We're just all equally broken people. And so I'm going to give you grace today because I'm going to need that grace back tomorrow. You know, just this week, I experienced this. My, one of my daughters was telling me that they felt overwhelmed about something in school. They were telling me about it. And I had had a really long, hard day at work. And, you know, they, they were kind of complaining. And I, was, I just wasn't really like, I was in like, hey, you just need to buckle up. You just, you, need, you just suck it up. You just need to press on. And in that moment, because I'm not good at giving myself grace, mostly because I hear the voice telling me to be better, to just, you know, to man up and, and to, you know, just suck it up and don't feel and don't hurt and don't, don't let those things happen. I began to pass that on to my daughter. And I didn't intend to be a conduit of shame, but you can't give what you don't have. And I want to ask today, genuinely, have you fully received the grace found in Jesus that you are loved regardless of what you've done and what's been done to you, that God can't love you anymore that the naked, condemned thief dying in a horrible smell on a cross who couldn't do a single thing, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. That there is an unconditional love because you are meant to be a son or daughter. Have you received that? I would say it this way. I'm going to put it up on the screen. God freely offers all the costly gift of grace. You see, there's a free gift of grace that God offers to everyone. Now it's free to you and I, but it costs God his only son because you are deeply loved. That's why at South Point we say you matter deeply to God. God loved you so much, he gives you undeserved grace at the highest cost, the death of his son on a cross because you are loved. The reality is as a follower of Jesus, I'm not better, I'm not more perfect, I'm just forgiven, and not because I earned it, or I deserved it, or I worked for it, or because I was born for it, but because God loved me, and I'm meant to be a child of His. If I was going to sum up the message, I would sum it up this way. Shame always tells a false story. Shame always lies, and it will whisper. And it won't always call itself shame. It'll go, I'm your friend. I'm your protector. I'm here to make sure you don't get hurt. Tells a false story meant to destroy the good God intended for our lives. Where we would be able to connect in community with others. We would be able to care and connect with creation. And we would be able to care and connect to our creator. But shame comes in and tells us a different story that we need to cover ourselves, we need to hide, and we need to blame. And all those things destroy the very life that you want and that you are meant for and that God wants for you. I would say it this way. Here's some steps we can take. Do the opposite. When it comes to that voice of shame, When it comes to that thing, do the opposite of what shame screams. And I get it. Shame screams at me on a daily basis. Do the opposite of what shame screams at us to do. First, freely receive God's grace. God loves you. God can't love you any more than he already does. You do not need to clean yourself up. God sees you. He sees you exactly as you are, and he still sent his son to die for you. Freely receive God's grace. Be vulnerable with someone who's trustworthy. At some point, we just have to share the real us with someone that's trustworthy and listen to the real story. I was having breakfast with a good friend the other day 
and we were talking about our morning rituals, and my friend's kind of a business person, and they were kind of talking about positivity and kind of meditating and making space, and I go, yeah, I try to do that every morning. I said, I make space to pray, and I make space to read my Bible every morning because the world will tell me a false story. The world will tell me I'm only as good as my performance. Shame will cry out and say, you'll never be good enough. Shame will tell me that I have to hide from God, and that I have to hide from people, and that I'll never be enough. Shame will lie to me every morning that I'm damaged goods and that they'll abandon me and I will be alone, but I need to hear a different story. So every morning I break out the Bible and I wanna be a part of the real story that I was meant for, a God who created me to be his son, a God who created you to be his son or daughter, a God who reached out to rescue us, who loves us, who you matter deeply to, that is the true story. And if you wanna know where to start, start with the Gospel of John. Now, I'm hoping that you stuck around to this point. I know that it's easy to go, well, shame doesn't apply to me and just ignore it. I know it's easy when we hear those words shame and the unbearable feeling makes us want to run and avoid it. I get it. And here's the reality. No matter how hard we try, shame is be a voice that you, that I, that we have to deal with on this side of eternity. However, there is good news. There's a story that can help you, that can help me, that can help us tell a different story than the story of shame. It's the story of a creator that we're meant to be in relationship. It's a story where we have genuine friendships, where we love each other and we see that we're not perfect where church isn't a place we have to hide or pretend, but church is a community of people of Jesus who go, we're all flawed and we're all gonna give each other the same grace and we choose to do that. Now we're not gonna ignore things that hurt each other, but we are going to give each other grace. And we're gonna walk in that and we're gonna live a different story. And so I have one simple challenge today, and it's this. We're gonna sing a song after I pray. And I encourage you to listen to the song because part of the lyric says, I am a child of God. Love has a story. And I want you to know today that shame was never meant to be your story. That love is the true story that God wants you to know and wants you to hear and wants you to live out. Let me pray. God, I just want to say thank you for your unconditional love. God, I pray that the comfort and peace of your unconditional love would give us the safety and the courage to not hide or ignore the voice of shame, but instead to do the exact opposite, to call it what it is, to be vulnerable, to give ourselves grace and receive grace, and to hear the true story on a daily basis. God, thank you that you have a different story for us and that you paid the highest price so that we could hear a story in our mind and the stories that we live with our lives would be stories worth living because you are good and you are loving and you created us for a good destiny. God, I pray for all of those who are hurting. God, that you would meet them where they're at. God, that you, through your Holy Spirit, would speak to our hearts and help us to take next steps. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Never forget, you matter deeply to God.